It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live, as opposed to not live. And, oh, I guess I could have done the audience over there and throw the microphone. But yeah, big audience. And <laughs> welcome to the big show. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. Let me see who is in the chat room. There they are. And House, who won the awesome Sure MV51 last week. Um, Lamar Franklin, Dan Weber, Linda Cullum, uh, Fen Tamalonis, Lamar Franklin, I think I said that already. Sherry Marcus Milano, John Pearson, Kenda Potter, Glenn Lest, um, Gloria Covington, Dean Turner, the usual gang of nah, really nice people. <laughs> I was going to make fun of you guys, but I wouldn't do that. It's too early in the show. Um, so this week, first of all, we are actually going to give this away. It's so hard to get this right. Um, the Sure MV5, which is kind of like the baby brother to the MV51 that Anne won last week. I'm going to unbox this puppy in a moment. Um, and a little later in the show, we're going to be joined again by Henry Winkle, who was on the show, I think, two or three weeks ago. Uh, he's a taxi member that's been a member for eh, four or five years, something like that. And I mentioned during the show that we would like some suggestions as to, uh, you know, new show ideas. We got a few. And uh, Henry sent something in, which I thought, you know, we've kind of covered this, but then again, he was so incredibly forthcoming and articulate uh, in the information he gave out the last time he was with us that I said, you know what, let's have him come back because um, the audience really liked it. We did, actually did get a lot of comments and emails and stuff. So in a few minutes, we're going to get to Henry Winkle. Um, he's a jazz dude, by the way, and uh, I have tremendous respect for jazz dudes. I actually went to college at the University of Miami in Florida, that Miami, not Miami U in Ohio. Uh, I was a business major and a music minor, and my sweet mates were um, jazz guys in the music department. It was not unusual to come back to my room at the end of pretending I was going to class and walk in and find like Pat Metheny sitting on my bed uh, jamming with my sweet mates. So, that was kind of cool. Um, and who did we have? We, uh, the head of the jazz school, like the professor or head of the department of residence was Jerry Mulligan, one of the jazz greats. Uh, and I was in the first group of students to take the recording program at the University of Miami, which is part of the music school, and uh, had a gentleman named Bill Porter, who was the head of that department, and Bill was Elvis's engineer. So. It was a great school, loved it, and learned a lot about jazz and uh, knew a lot of jazz people. So I have a deep appreciation of people like Henry Winkle. So without any further ado, first of all, before Bria starts kicking me under the table, as she's known to do, she's smiling, she's like, her legs can't even reach me, hit the subscribe button, which is... Uh, I, can't, I, I can't do stuff with two hands. It's right there. Hit it now. Did you? I'm watching you. And share with your friends. Even if you have like dead relatives, share. They should know about this show. And of course, like us. And I'm going to add a new thing which uh, to your regimen, which is, see, I've got to get this out of the way. See that little bell up there? Oh, I don't have that page open. Um, the little bell in your upper right-hand corner, little bell-shaped thing. If you click that anytime, like sometimes we do shows on the spur of the moment, and you'll get a notification. So there you go. Do all that stuff, and uh, maybe you'll win something like this. Eh, you won't because we just pick people randomly, but it's nice to create a fantasy whenever possible. So I am going to now... Um, oh, man, I lost my other dudes. <laughs> Oh, bad when you lose stuff. Uh, I don't know what else to push on here. I'm going to do an unboxing of the Shure MV5. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I should read a little something about this. I um, mean, this is straight from the folks at Shure. With an iconic design that inspires performance, the MV5 condenser microphone, by the way, offers professional quality audio plus the flexibility of both iOS and USB connectivity. That's like tech speak for 
we can handle people that have those guys, not just iPhones. By the way, I love my phone. I really do. Um, I only dial phone calls on it and take the occasional picture, but I love my phone. Um, anyway, uh, plug in and get to work right away or take advantage of three onboard DSP presets to quickly dial in the right sound for your project. Um, so it's got like a, a voice mode, a singing mode, and an instrument mode if memory serves. For enhanced control, this is interesting, over EQ, compression, and more, dive deeper with the free Sure Plus Motive mobile recording app for iOS, which features recording, editing, and the option to share your recordings with the world, zero latency headphone monitoring with volume and mute, and an adjustable, oh, it comes with an adjustable stand uh, that completes the recording experience. If I remember correctly, the software, um, I don't know why I don't have that on here. But if I remember correctly, the um, SharePlus Motive mobile recording app actually has more like EQ control and stuff like that built into it. So it's kind of cool. It's the best of digital stuff combined with a condenser microphone. So let us unbox. First of all, this tells me something. It's got this dandy little plastic tab at the top, which tells me if it's not already, it will probably soon be hanging in an Apple store near you. Did you see the video of those guys that went in that Apple store? It's like 10 dudes, now nah, let's say three to five dudes, maybe I exaggerated. Um, they ran in the store and just started yanking laptops and, and iPads and phones and just ran out of the store with like $37,000 worth of stuff in about 10 seconds. So not that I'm saying that you should do that, but apparently it's pretty easy, just saying. Uh, maybe Apple should up their security a bit or put stronger wires, you know those little flimsy wires they have that hold stuff down? Um, maybe they should double up. Anyway, opening up the box. I guess I should hold it up if I'm doing an unboxing, right? Here we go again, although I, I checked this one out in advance, a lot easier to open than the last one. So there we go, we're opening it up. Bria says she got the last one put back together, back together ra rather rapidly, right? It wasn't that hard. Um, so here's the microphone itself, which appears to be about the size of a peach, unless you buy the giant peaches at Costco, which are obviously raised near a nuclear plant. Um, there it is. This one's black with a little blue. That's funny. Wow, looking at it one way, it looks to be blue, but it's actually red. It's got a red windscreen inside. So I'd say it weighs about six ounces, I'm just guessing. Um, it's got a little doodad on the back for putting it on the stand or an adapter. I think they call that a doodad in the manual. And then interestingly enough, it's got this shiz back here. Um, it's got the USB thing, and it's got a little um, ring tip sleeve thing for the headphones. So like I said uh, when I was reading the stuff from Sure, you can actually plug into this. So while you're recording, rather than having the latency of going from the microphone into your whatever, your you know Pro Tools or what have you, um, and then back out and getting a little latency, which can be annoying. Um, you can plug right into this so that you can like feel the groove when you're playing your guitar. Um, just to prove to you I am unboxing. I think in the Western Hemisphere we call this a wire with a connector. It's got a micro USB and a big fat regular old-fashioned USB. Okay, I got an A for getting that right. People are saying that it looks like uh, Luke Skywalker's training ball or the Death Star. <laughs> it is. It, it it does look like the Death Star. I'll give you that. Um, this is so embarrassing. I mean, it's not like I lift weights or anything, but it, there we go. Seriously, I don't want to rip this apart, which if I were at home and I just bought this thing, I would just rip it apart because that's the way I unbox stuff in real life. Oh, look at this. We have yet another connector. Um, let's open this one up with a pair of scissors. So whoever wins this, you're getting a slightly pre-opened one. 
Oh, I see what this is. So this is a micro USB to an Apple Lightning connector. So that way you can come out of the mic and go right into your Apple device. For those of you who love to follow a convention and buy Apple products. <laughs> Just a second. Feeling a little competitive. Um, and here yeah, is, I actually really like this. Look at that. You get a ball hanging on a thing. Oh, that's the stand, I see. So this is how that works. Um, you take the stand. You're never getting this one back together. I have totally screwed this up. This is like the Rubik's Cube of unboxing. There we go. No, we don't. Anyway, <laughs> it goes like that. <laughs> Here, I'm going to hand this over to Bria because it's really hard to do on screen. Um, I have performance anxiety. I am with the show. Um, no, it's not a disco ball. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, see, you got it's much easier than I made it look. Uh, except that it seems like something's wrong here. What? There we go. <laughs> Capriya had it with the microphone. I'm not really sure. I think that's the right way. Uh, I'm not. There we go. I don't know. Anyway, um, oh yeah, that's the front. Okay, so there it is mounted on the stand and then you come out of the back with the connectors, obviously. So there you have it. That's the Shure MV5 and one of you lucky viewers. Uh, yeah, good try, Michael. That's, I've heard that before. Um, one of our lucky viewers is gonna win the Shure MV5 and get free wires. Um, somewhere near the end of the show and then Bria will send it to you after she puts it back together which good luck with that anyway, you could now you know why I don't do actual unboxing videos but you should see me on my makeup blog um, vlog blog what did they call that where those young ladies do makeup um, tutorials a makeup tutorial see just when you think I'm kidding there you go. I've been known to do a makeup tutorial, but you have to figure out what. Got some residue I, on your face. I have residue on my face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There. there we go. If I had residue, now I've got more residue to cover it up. Things are looking good. Anyway, uh, yeah, now you know why I don't do any kind of tutorials. I just do the big show. And for people who've never watched the show before and they're watching the video archive later and you're wondering, what is going on? The guy just spent 13 minutes doing that. It's because I know the chat room fills up over time. So I do like to stall a little bit. Anyway, so without any further ado, I'm going to call... Henry Winkle. Remember, turn off your speakers, Henry, because here comes Lasco. Uh, speaker. Oh, yeah, it works better when you do the whole number. <laughs> Nine, one. <laughs> They don't really let me play with stuff so around here, so I don't have his name is showing up. There we go. I'm so excited. I got Hello, Henry. Hi. All right, let's test that volume. Say something to say hello to your fellow members. Hello, everyone. All right, hopefully the level's good. Um, somebody says I should have a rock star, which Yes, I should. All right, Henry. Welcome back to the big show. Really glad to have you here. You knocked it out of the park last time. Um, we got so many comments, and all of them were positive. So we're glad to have you back. Um, well, of course. And, and Henry sent us an email um, last week after the show. It said, hi, Michael and Bria. If you're ever looking for an idea for Taxi TV, I have one that I think would make a great episode. Um, 
forwards and returns. And he doesn't mean like forwards and returns when we do that, where we all vote together and figure out if you guys line up with our A and R team or not. Um, in short, how to improve your forward to return ratio. I got the idea from a comment in the chat room where someone said he had a 7% forward rate. I thought he must be new to taxi and I've got some ideas that could help him. But then I mentioned the chat room comment to my friend Joe Gothard. And Joe said, I think that's better than my forward percentage. Excuse me. Um, by the way, if I belch during the show today, it's because I had a really bad like microwave uh, dinner a couple of hours ago for lunch and my stomach is a little unsettled to say the least right now. Anyway, uh, uh, Henry's friend Joe Gothard said, I think that's better than my forward percentage. Henry thought he was joking. Joe's a thir thoroughly competent guitarist. My, what a big compliment that was. <laughs> not a great guitarist, not an awesome guitarist, but thoroughly competent. I'm sure you didn't mean it that way. And he's been with Taxi for about eight years. Joe and I collaborate and get regular placements. Here are his numbers, which he said would be fine to share. In 2016, he had 114 submissions um, and six forwards. In 2017, he had 80 submissions with six forwards. Uh, in 2018, so far, uh, we're what, five, six months, uh, seven months into the year, um, 48 submissions, nine forwards, four of which were co-writes with the aforementioned Mr. Winkle, who's on the phone with us. So if someone as competent as Joe is struggling with getting forwards, then my guess is that others are struggling as well. Well, yeah, that's true. Some proposed topics we could discuss to help these people include, A, if you're gonna treat music as a business, you have to have a system. So can you address that system, Henry, and, and talk about that at length? Yeah, I, I can, but I, you know, as long as we mentioned uh, Joe's numbers, um, I think it's only fair that I mentioned my numbers in my first year at Taxi. That was 2013. Okay. I had nine forwards, and 49 returns. Okay. I really hadn't, I really hadn't figured anything out yet. And, and I was, uh, like, like I said in the previous show, I had a jazz album, and I was trying to force feed that album uh, into listings that weren't appropriate. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons. As a matter of fact, uh, when Bria asked for a couple of tracks, I went and scrolled down and saw that the first two tracks that I submitted to Taxi in 2013 were two tracks from my album. And they were for a traditional uh, jazz listing, and I'm not gonna say whether they were forwarded or returned, but the important thing to note is that I submitted these to a, to a traditional jazz listing, and so later on when you play them, people can try to figure out whether they were forwarded or returned. Okay. Now, Good okay, idea. so, and in my second year, uh, it was a little better, it was 17 forwards, no, 17 forwards, 38 returns. That's a little better. And I really hadn't figured anything out yet, and I hadn't uh, I'd gotten a little better because I watched Sassy TV and I'd learned some stuff. And I'd gotten a lot of returns and I'd learned some stuff. But it really wasn't until my third year that I thought, you know, I need a, a system where I can, I can track uh, my forwards, my returns, screener comments with the listing. So I started um, two Word documents, and one was called Forwards. And... Uh, I would copy and paste the entire listing description and then any forwards that I've gotten for that listing. And, they, and the other was called screener comments. And uh, that was what, where I would just uh, name every track or, or put down the name of every track and every screener comment, um, whether it was negative, whether it was positive. And, and if it was uh, a return, I, I'd put it, the screener comment in, in italics so that I can, I can I could differentiate more easily. Right. And when you do something like that, surprisingly, you're going to find that you're going to get returns and forwards for the same truck. You know, you, you it might be split half and half. It might be nine forwards, and then you get that one screener that that um, that returns it. And I, I think there are three reasons for that. Okay. And one of them is um, screening music is subjective. And I know you, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to agree with that or not, but no, I absolutely it's, it's agree. Like, uh, when, when the movie Avatar came out, I went to see it with one of my best friends. I thoroughly enjoyed it. He hated it because he said it was trite and hackneyed. Now, I, 
couldn't really argue with that. So I, I think listening to music and uh, and judging music um, is really subjective. The other reason... If I can insert a, a comment there just for a second about oh, Avatar. Sure. I think your friends are racist. He obviously didn't like eight-foot-tall blue people. <laughs> I actually th I adore that movie. I'm with you, Henry. Anyway, sorry to, if I broke up your rhythm there. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the second is um, the music. Um, I think that... Tension, because I'm, you know, I mainly do tension cues and, and jazz cues. And in tension cues, or in many listings, there might be one word that you miss that makes a huge difference. And it, it could be a word like subtle. And um, uh, yeah, I, In the yeah, context uh, of the listing, what the listing says, missing a word, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so, if, so if a listing, if, if a listing, if I, if I don't read it real carefully, and I miss the word subtle, and I submit some tension cues that aren't that subtle because, hey, they've been forwarded before, uh, and then they come back and, it, and, and, it, and the screener says, not subtle enough for this listing. And then the third reason is because you submit a track, it gets a return, the screener says, this is what's wrong, this is what you need to do, you fix it, and then you submit it again, and now it gets a forward. So, but, but what system comes in handy as far as helping your forward percentage is let's say uh, a listing comes out for dark drony ambient underscore. Right. Well, then you go to your you go to your forwards document, and you do a search for each one of those words, and then you write down the tracks that got forwarded, and now and now you've got you know six or seven maybe uh, forwards, and then you go into your screener comment section, and you see well what do the screeners have to say about this, and maybe one screener said. Uh, this wasn't subtle enough, and you look, at, you, you you look at your cue, and you go, oh wow, uh, that got returned for that reason, and it, and it mentions subtle in the listing description, so you cross that one out. Well, when you have, and that's a pretty simple system, you know. I know that people have a lot more complicated systems out there, got spreadsheets and percentages and all that. This is just two word documents. But now when I when I started submitting tracks, it was based on somewhat of an informed decision. And after I did that, I started seeing my, my forward uh, to return ratio improve. I find it so amazing that most of our members don't do anything along the lines of what you're explaining, which I think is remarkably simple. And you're absolutely right that just because something has been forwarded, I mean, we even get comments from people that say, you know, I've already got this thing in a non-exclusive library and they love it. And it's actually made me some money in some reality TV shows and you guys didn't forward it. Uh, it is all about the context. They might have missed that single sentence or a single word in the listing that says something that kept it from being forwarded because that library or that music supervisor is looking for something, you know, not just a tension cue, but maybe drony tension cues that don't get too big or too dramatic and don't have sort of a uh, crescendo to a big finale at the end, you know, but they're, they're consistent from top to bottom, um, just enough to make your palms get a little sweaty. But they miss that part and they just see the first sentence that says drony tension cues. And then somehow the screener becomes the bad guy in that equation. Right. So um, you also mentioned beyond your system that uh, the importance of finding your niche. Um, can you talk about that at, at some length? Yeah, it, it took me uh, two years to find what mine was, and and that was um, that was in that was in my third year, and I've been experimenting with different genres, and and by the way. You know, with that, uh, with that horrible um, nine forwards and uh, 49 returns, I really didn't consider quitting because I, I thought, you know, taxi is really the, the only only way for me to get my music out there. And, uh, you know, and, and I thought someday I'm gonna get this, I just gotta keep at it. So it took me about two and a half years to, to find my niche or niche, if you took French class. <laughs> and. Um, so, and that was tension cues, and I'd experimented with other stuff, but I, I thought tension cues, this is kind of fun. Now, and, uh, if I can interrupt you for a second, now you're an accomplished jazz musician. I've heard some of your work, uh, and I know that you've hired like 
le very legit, like big time jazz folks to play on, on your um, recordings and stuff. What was it that made you even go looking for another niche? Well, there weren't that many jazz listings to begin with. And, you know, um, let me say some, something about, about Joe first. Joe, I asked Joe, why do you think your, uh, your, forward, uh, your forwards are so low? And he said, well, uh, I like trying different genres. Maybe I just spread myself too thin. Well, he's, ha he's having fun doing this. He's found his niche, and his niche is smooth jazz. And he has a lot of his tracks signed by what I consider to be one of the best libraries around. And that library is getting in regular regular placements on TV. Uh -huh. So that's the reason. But you know what? It's fun to, to see a, a, an epic, uh, epic hybrid orchestral and go, well, let me see if I can do that. And, uh, you know, I found out that that was just way too much work, although it's fun. And tension cues weren't that much work. And uh, you, I think you know uh, you found your niche when libraries start asking you how many more of these do you have that are like this? And when you start seeing placements on TV. And um, when I started tension cues, did I get libraries breaking down my door asking that question? You know, uh, did I see any placements on TV? What did I, what did I see a lot of? Returns. I got a ton of returns. I, you know, I, I, I checked out my archive uh, submissions yesterday, and I can tell exactly when I started doing tension. When you started doing what? You broke up a little. Uh, I'm sorry. When I started doing tension cues. Um, because, if uh, I can interject something, I've got to say, uh, I don't know if I've ever publicly admitted this before or not, but it, it I personally, as the owner of Taxi, find it a little disturbing when I see people posting their numbers uh, on the success story thing, uh, especially on the success story area of the Taxi Forum, because it's really about success stories. Sometimes people go on there, maybe they're a little frustrated. Well, yeah, I got a couple forwards, or I signed one thing, you know, but it was, it was I had four out of 97 or whatever the numbers are. And they put those numbers up there. It's very misleading for somebody that's not hearing what you're saying today or somebody who's not part of the, the broader taxi family or part of our ecosystem in that what the casual observer who's not a member and is maybe thinking about uh, joining taxi or thinking about going after some film and TV stuff is they see the, uh, the ratios and they don't know that important backstory information, a big part of which... I believe is the fact that people are kind of casting about, uh, to use a fishing analogy, looking for that area where they get some traction. And in the process of doing that, yeah, their numbers look pretty discouraging. And then just like you, they, they find that niche and all of a sudden they start to get some traction, things change dramatically. So for those of you who feel um, after this show uh, empowered or encouraged uh, to go on the taxi forum and the success story area and post post your stuff up there, um, please know that when you do that, I'd really appreciate it. Actually, don't do it on the success story area. Do it elsewhere, like in the general hangout or something. But if you do it, please give some context um, just so it doesn't discourage other people or mislead them. So there, thank you for letting me jump in and say that, Henry, and please continue. Hey, jump in any time. It's your show. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, um, so, so in 2015, I had my system in place, and I started doing tension cues. And, um, and I, then I, I got a lot of returns. And the, I still remember the comments that the, that the screeners made. They, was, they said things like, needs more dynamic change-ups. Sounds more like a horror, I uh, hope, hope I said that clearly, than uh, CSI <laughs> investigate. Uh, too dark and ominous. Where is the melodic motif the listening is asking for? Uh, need, needs more melodic development. Needs more variety. Needs to breathe more. So these were the comments I was getting from the um, screeners. So I had to figure out what am I going to do to solve these problems. And as far as uh, needs more dynamic change-ups, I started experimenting with um, uh, volume automation on each track. And if you look at one of my tracks, uh, one of my tension cue tracks, you see lines going up and down, up and down, up and down, like, like little pyramids. So, so sounds are weaving in, they're weaving out. The mistake I made in the beginning is, 
is I would just have a sound play all the way through. And that's, that's one of the biggest um, problems that I see when people ask me to critique their, their attention cues is, there, is the sameness throughout the cue. What you hear in the beginning, you hear in the middle, and then you hear in the end. And the, the other problem that I hear is, is dated sound. And those, those really stand out. And so, um, uh, give some examples. So that, of, give some examples of instruments that might have some dated sounds. I mean, not, oh. not specific software, but you know, are you talking strings, horns, guitars, drums, what? No, I'm mainly talking about electronic sounds, uh, and I, I'm not talking about EDM, um, but I'm talking about just the kind of electronic sounds that, that you hear in a, in a tension cue, uh -huh. and, um, and and you know what? Even a drone cue. That doesn't mean you have to have the same drone playing all the way through the queue. You, you're allowed to change drones. And uh, I, 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 think, I think that's important. I, think I had to learn how to differentiate between a horror and an investigative. And the conclusion I came to was it's all about the sounds. I think investigative sounds can be used in a horror queue, but not vice versa. That's, a, gr that's a great you know, comment. I'm really glad you brought that up. You know, it'd probably be a good idea for um, our members to make a list uh, of the types of drones that are out there because you're right. Like the um, stuff that you would hear maybe in a film like Sicario um, or versus, you know, a, a science show, something about interstellar whatever. Those are different kinds of drones, and, and a horror drone versus a tension drone. You're absolutely right. So there, there are subsets, but people in the industry that ask for them generally don't even realize that themselves, I think. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for the endorsement you gave me on that, Henry. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I, I was noticing a, a comment in, in the chat room, and yeah, I'm about to work on my pronunciation of at least one word. and. And Joe, I was talking to Joe earlier, and he said, you got to be careful. I'm, I'm going to wait and see how the chat room reacts when you say that. So I'm going to find a synonym for that word at some point. Or I'm just not going to bring it up again, maybe. maybe um, that's a good idea. Horrific. Horrific. Yeah, there yeah, you go. That, because as long as Peter word. Rahill's in the chat room, there's going to be at least one person picking up on your pronunciation of horror. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had said it that that, that well. And, and, you know, let, let's call it what it is. You're coming through on a speakerphone into a microphone. You know, it's not exactly yeah. optimal audio time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not going to beat myself up after the show, so. Yeah, I would. It, it, it's fine. Um, needs more variety. Well, how do you do that? Well, you bring something in every four bars, or at least every eight bars, or you take something out every four bars. You know, an attention cue the ear gets kind of tired after four bars, and it, it wants, the brain, it wants something new. It wants to hear a new sound, or it wants to hear something taken out. That's just important. Or maybe you bring something in and take something out at the same, at the same time. Um, with, a, um, with a pad, I, I like to basically bounce MIDI to audio as soon as I'm happy with the track, because, because I, I like messing with audio better than I like uh, messing with MIDI. So, MIDI. so if I have a pad, Sometimes I'll try to put a pitch shifter on there. And uh, let, let's say I'm playing C, and I, I put the, the percentage of, of pitch shift to zero, then it's gonna play a C. And then I automate it so it slowly goes up uh, a whole tone. Well, what, when it gets to 50%, it's gonna be playing a C and a C sharp at the same time. And then eventually it's, it's gonna be playing a, a D. And what that, what that does is it takes a pad that's just a static pad and it gives it some, some life and some development over the course of time. And, that, and that's another way to, uh, to, to bring uh, variety in. And, and then the final thing was needs to breathe more, needs to create some space. And I think it's always a good idea when you think you're finished with a mix, you look for things to take out. Um, what, what, do, what do I not need? That goes what do back... I have uh, to something that I learned very early in my career, which is just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Right, right, exactly. Uh, you know, less is sometimes better. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 you know, creating a space also where there's not, not much going on or, or it's a very low volume is also, is also a very effective. 
So, um, and before yeah, when you're fun. talking about, I mean, it's something that we mention in, in virtually all of our instrumental listings is um, sticking, um, I can't think of the word we use all the time, but, uh, oh, sticking with a, a central motif from top to bottom. Obviously, people are capable of scoring a film and, and they know how to create, to go from tension to elation to trepidation. Uh, but within one cue, you want it to be one thing, which makes it much easier for the editor and much easier for the music supervisor to use it. If it's jumping around between this emotion and that emotion or mood, um, they can't really use it because the picture and the edits that they've got won't line up with what you've done. So I want to make it clear and underscore what you said a little bit, which is about bringing stuff in and taking it out to give it some forward movement to keep it from being boring and and too much the same from top to bottom um it is often just as simple as you know maybe changing the voicing of a chord um or maybe just adding uh, a little bit of reverb to something in the next section where it didn't exist before um, and leaving that reverb in there until you get further down the line and you break it back down again. It can be subtle changes. There, um, I just want to make it, sure, uh, make, make it clear that Henry isn't talking about trying to score a film. He's talking about subtle changes that keep it interesting enough. If it's too interesting, it will pull the viewer out of the storyline and away from the actors and, and their emotions. So your job as the person creating those cues is to create something that elevates the emotion and makes your palms sweat a little more or makes your heart a little happier or makes you filled with more wonderment, whatever the emotion is that you're going for. But you don't want people to go, wow, that's an awesome cue because if they did, you're not doing your job. Is a fair right. statement? Okay, I said fair statement, and you went right, and I stepped yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, fair statement. Um, there's, there's, there's one other little subtle thing that, that I like doing. If, if, I, if I have a sound, and let, let's say it's like a one shot, and I put some delay on it, and then I want to repeat it in the next bar or, or two bars down, I won't repeat it at the same volume. What I'll do is I'll, is, is I'll the first one will be in your face. You're really going to notice it. The second one is going to be 9, 10 uh, dB softer. And what, and what that does is it does a couple of things. It, um, it creates variety. You're not hearing the same sound the same way. And it, it also creates the illusion of, of 3D in your mix because it, in real life, uh, the farther away a sound gets from you, the softer it gets. So it sounds like first you hear that sound and it's right there next to you, and then you hear it it's way, way in the background. So, so it's, it, it's an interesting effect. Uh, while we're on that subject, I want to interject something that I actually did devoted an entire Taxi TV episode to years ago when my now relatively adult uh, daughters were probably in grade school. I use, you know, all the kids uh, have those little tables and chairs, the plastic molded stuff and the little, you know, um, house, uh, the stuff that's like big enough for a kid to crawl in or sit on. So one day I was in our backyard and we we're very fortunate. We, we live in Los Angeles, which from a tax perspective, not that fortunate, but from uh, the view in our backyard, we look out at a mountain range from slightly under a mile away and it's pretty breathtaking. So if you look at our backyard, you see, you know, maybe 20, 25 feet deep of yard and then it drops off uh, the back part of our yard. It goes down a hill, but, um, there's some bushes and roses and stuff kind of where the, the yard meets the drop off. And then beyond that, there are some houses in the mid ground. And beyond that is the mountain um, way back in the background. And I pointed out using our kids furniture, I was trying to explain to people um, the oral landscape as it relates to a visual landscape. And if you look at a landscape photograph or a painting, you'll notice that the colors are more vibrant in the foreground. They're less vibrant in the midground and they're much more muted in the in the background. So the same thing, and, and this is underscoring what you just said, um, same thing is true of sound. The farther the sound has to travel to the listener from the source, um, the more you're gonna lose some top end, you're gonna lose some bottom end, and you're gonna lose some volume. 
So if you think of that, um, not everything has to be right there in your face. Some things are way out there, some are in the midground, and some are up close. And that simple bit of knowledge makes mixing so much easier. And from a composer's perspective, when building any kind of instrumental track, I think the same thing would be helpful as well. Huh, interesting. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to pat myself on the back for that little soliloquy. <laughs> um, you also mentioned um, screener input earlier, and you mentioned it in your email. Um, how often do you find the screener input? Because, you know, some people say, oh, my thing wasn't forwarded. The screener said it wasn't forwarded because uh, the track was a little too busy. Uh, when I find that more often than not, if you look at the actual feedback form, that the, that the screener mentioned it as, oh, by the way, for future reference, this one's a little too busy. And, and the real reason it wasn't forwarded because of the context. Uh, I think you mentioned very early in the show that um, the listing, you know, one listing might have asked for drones, the next listing also asked for drones, but asked for subtle drones. And the member who makes a submission missed the subtle part, but they, they locked in on the fact that the screener made what they were hoping was a helpful comment in general for future reference. Do you find the screener feedback to be helpful or laughable? Oh, that, that's not, not even a fair question. Like it's, <laughs> you know, that's how you learn. That's absolutely how you learn. I, I mean, I learned from three different sources. I learned from watching your TV show, I learned from screener input, and I learned from um, just just going to YouTube videos and watching uh, YouTube videos on mixing and mastering and orchestration and, and, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah, screener input, I don't like to see the uh, Dear Henry, we listen carefully emails right. that much, but, but my first reaction is, well, why did this get returned? And most of the time, I'll go, oh yeah, well, that kind of makes sense. So, I think I will, uh, go ahead. I think I, I think I will do that next time, you know, or, or, or I'm going to take that, that part out. And it's, it's, uh, I can't really remember when I've just disagreed with a, a screener. I, I, I had kind of a strange uh, thing happen, which was, uh, it was a classical uh, piece. It sounds kind of like Mozart. And not that I'm comparing myself with Mozart, but it sounds kind of in that era. And it's gotten forwarded a number of times. And, I just recently got a return and the screeners liked it, but he said that there was a buzzing. And I said, buzzing? And I pulled up the MP3 and I listened to it and I didn't hear any buzzing. And then I um, went to my taxi side. I said, maybe it's something on my taxi side. And I didn't hear any buzzing. So I asked a couple of friends of mine, um, let me know if you can hear buzzing. And they both said no. So I, I just, uh, emailed the head screener and I said, you know, I don't hear buzzing. A couple of my friends don't hear buzzing. Can you just give us a listen and uh, see if you hear buzzing? Well, he heard buzzing. So hmm. I wasn't disagreeing with the screener, but I can't hear the buzzing. But more than one person on your end can hear the buzzing. And uh, so, so I don't know. That, that's a problem I don't know how to fix. If I can't hear it, I guess I could try try a remix with with like you know newer equipment that I have now, but. But other than that, I think that that was an anomaly. Um, it sounds like it, but you know, sometimes we find that uh, anomalous glitches happen when things are uploaded to the member's hosting uh, site or hosting page uh, at taximusic.com. Um, I'm trying to think of how else that could happen. Uh, was the buzzing like a distortion? or Well, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this, but it did, did it sound like a 60 hertz hum or, you know, like a shorted cable or something? Or you don't know because you didn't well, hear it. I, I couldn't hear it. And, and uh, you know, rather than give, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's a problem on my taxi site with the upload. That's what I thought. And so, so I said, hey, here's my taxi site. Can you listen to this track with headphones mm. and see if you can hear a buzzing? And nobody could hear a buzzing, so I, I couldn't hear the buzzing. But it, but apparently, the head, uh, I shouldn't say apparently, um, but the head screener heard it, and um, I think uh, Tom also heard it, and then uh, the screener who screened my track, he also heard it or she. So um, it was. But but 
said, you know what? I mean, I, I'm in my fifth year with taxi, and that's never happened before. You know, and, and most of the times, uh, almost almost 100 percent of the time, um, I will take a screen. It's really important because you have you have to learn, and, and the screener is basically saying, this is the cool this is a cool track, but, and then you have to look at the butt part of that. Well, I didn't say that well, but anyway, I you you have to look at that that part of the comment and go, okay. I can fix that, or that's going to be an easy fix, or that. You know, most fixes are pretty easy, uh, at least in tangent cues. Yeah, I'm. I'm really glad that you're pointing that stuff out. I'm also glad that you pointed out that we've got a head screener. Uh, we do have somebody whose full-time job on the staff is looking into issues like that, whether it's a screener that is repeatedly, um, sometimes people accuse the screeners of copying and pasting because they see the same comment or something very close used over and over. Well, if they sat in the screener's chair for a week, they'd quickly realize that so many of the mistakes are common to many of the members on many of the same types of songs or instrumentals. It's really hard. You don't want to sit there and just make up stuff because you realize that you're not saying it in a fresh way and that you've said it that way 50 times already in the last three days. So I can understand why people sometimes look at it and go, it seems like copy and paste. It's not. I mean, we have had probably three or four incidents in 26 years where we busted a screener copying and pasting. Like I said, three or four incidents out of three or four hundred screeners over a period of 26 years and those people were obviously never used again and and by the way we actually do have a a screener handbook and people know when they come to work here as a screener that uh if they ever copy and paste and, and we have people by the way the head screener actually looks at the critiques to make sure that that isn't going on so i'm glad you pointed that out also i'm glad that you pointed out the head screener because it's important for people to know that it's not some screener sitting in a chair looking you know at a piece of music going haha what can i bust this member on today their attitude is not like people sometimes want to believe where they're trying to keep people out of the industry the screeners are all music lovers. They're all music creators, almost to the person. Um, and they derive a real joy from finding the great stuff. They, they you know, will share it with other screeners. They'll go into the head screener, into the A&R staff, um, the people who get the listings, write the listings, schedule everything, and go, wow, check this out. I found something awesome. So they're into it. The spirit that they have is the spirit that our members would want them to have. And it's not like we made that happen. It just happened because of the people they are. But our members should know that we have layers of protection built in. Not to say that we're 100% perfect 100% of the time, but we've tried so hard over the years to perfect the system so that you guys are always getting the benefit of the doubt and getting heard in the right context. And I'm so grateful that you brought up the head screener because most people don't even know that we've got that. And if you have an issue, something, you know, if, if you have a major issue with the critique, you can email headscreener at taxi.com. If you see um, something that's overly repetitious, um, anything, not just your ego versus what the screener said, please don't spend their time on that. But if you see real issues, and give it a day. Don't react when you first get the critique and fire off an email to head screener. Simmer down for 24 hours, but then email the head screener and say, can you look into this? They will and get back to you in a pretty timely fashion. And we appreciate the feedback and we do want to know if something is amiss. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Henry. Um, you also mentioned in your email the importance of composing specifically for a listing. Um, I know that many of our members will go into the forward section of the forum, which is forums.taxi.com. Um, I don't know what the, it's, you'll see a section right at the top of the page called forums. Also, Bria, can you put in, in the chat um, the URL for your forward blog that you do? I think a lot of our members don't realize that Bria posts uh, the names and titles, the names of the members and the titles of their music that was forwarded for every single taxi listing. Um, so especially in the forward section of the, of the forum, a lot of people will link to their own music, which we can't do for them because uh, some of the music isn't meant to be public. Certain people don't want their music heard publicly for a myriad of reasons. 
Um, most do, but if they're putting it in the forward section of the Taxi Forum, which again is at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com, you can hear the stuff that was forwarded for a listing that you may have been returned for. And so many of our most successful members will say that that's been a big part of their secret to success is they hear the stuff that was forwarded and they go, oh, now I see why mine wasn't. And they learn from the stuff that was. So have you ever done that, Henry? Yes, absolutely. I, um, when I was new to taxi, I asked myself, well, what, what, why didn't I get a forward? And I, hey, you're, you're the one who clued me into this, as a matter of fact. Mm. And, uh, and, and I'd go to the uh, forward section, and I'd, I'd think, yeah, that's, that's better than what I did. And, uh, not, you know, that's the level I need to be. And, and as far as composing for the listing, that's what I did not do my first year. Uh, I, thought, I thought my jazz tracks from my CD are so good that I can submit them, and, and they're really smooth jazz, but I thought I can submit them to a traditional jazz listing, and the screener's going to say, this track is so good that I'm going to have to forward it, I just can't stop myself. And, <laughs> and that never happened. I and love you, Henry. <laughs> I love it. You are so incredibly honest with yourself that it's refreshing. Uh, I, I've met a lot of people over the years, and I certainly understand why it's hard to be objective and honest about your own stuff. But, man, oh, man, your attitude and your approach is just amazing. You also mentioned in the email uh, about reverse engineering um, the reference queue. So can you kind of go in depth on that? I'm going to go make the air conditioner a tad warmer in here because I see icicles. Uh, Bria's going. Uh, I see icicles forming on my screen. But can you go more in depth on how you go about reverse engineering uh, a queue? Well, yeah, basically, um, some people recommend taking a YouTube video, which, which is, you know, the reference track, for instance, and using a um, YouTube to MP3 converter, and then putting that MP3 in your DAW, so you can kind of match up what you're doing. I don't really think that's necessary. I, I think you can just listen on, on YouTube, and, and, and what you do is you try to match up, uh, like, like, say, it's a... Um, uh, Resner Atticus Ross track, and, and and you try to listen to the sounds that they use. Are are those dense pads, or are they or are they, um, are, are they like translucent? Uh, what kind of pads are they using? When are they bringing in a certain sound? Oh, look! At the end, he's he's bringing in some kind of arpeggiated thing. I think I think I'll try that. And it, I find uh, the reference tracks are not only educational, but they're but they're inspirational. A lot of times, I'll listen to a reference track. And there was one recently that was for um, a modern solo piano. And uh, I was watching this guy, Chili Rodriguez, and he was he was playing a piece only on the white keys. And I thought, well, that was kind of interesting. And so um, I figured I'd try that out, but, but I ended up playing a, playing a, a, writing a, a track that was all on the black keys. I probably never would have thought of that uh, if, I had, if I hadn't seen that, that video. So, um, not too long ago, it was a couple of weeks ago, a music supervisor approached uh, me and said, C can you do anything like Miles Davis' um, classic, So What? And I said, well, I, I don't really know a trumpet player. Uh, and so I, I contacted Paul Couteau, who's a saxophone player, and I said, do you, you know anyone that plays trumpet, or do you play trumpet? And Paul said, I play trumpet. Now, I think that's pretty unusual, but, uh, you know, I... I don't play those instruments. And as far as Paul's concerned, I think he also plays keys, and he also plays drums. And the only thing i got to say about that is, what a show-off. <laughs> but, but what I did was, was I reverse-engineered that Miles Davis track. It's a real famous track. Uh, it starts out with a melodic bass line and then a two-chord descending progression, and that's the first eight bars. And then uh, Miles Davis comes in, and... Uh, it's it's just a, initially it's the bass and the piano, and then it's uh, the bass, the piano, then Miles comes in, and then it, then he he goes up half a step, plays the same thing, and then goes back, and then and then it goes into a, into a swing. So so the reverse engineer of that was I, I came up with a melodic uh, bass track that didn't sound anything like Miles, uh, and instead of a uh, two chord descending progression, I had a three chord ascending progression, and instead of going up a half step, I went up a whole step, and so. Uh, subtle differences, but the, but the mechanics, the overall mechanics are kind of the same. Now, uh, you know, one of my points too was it's always good to have a second set of ears uh, on, on anything that you do, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or, or whether it's um, if you're collaborating with, with somebody. So I, 
hooked him up with a piano and the up, and upright bass, and I, and I sent it to Paul, and Paul sent me back an email and said, here's what I'm hearing. And he'd incorporated some of my ideas, but then he'd come up with uh, some ideas of his own. And uh, yeah, I wrote him, I said, honestly, I like what you came up with better than what I came up with. And if you're collaborating, um, that's the kind of attitude you have to have. You know, uh, I, I know people who have gotten ticked off because someone might, might have changed their notes or their chord progressions, but, that, but that's not really going to work in a collaboration. So, so because of Paul's input, I, I changed what I did, and it turned out to be a better track. I've got to say, Henry, I'm so impressed with you, and I'm not kissing your butt here, but, uh, you know, we've met personally a couple of times. Um, you're really evolving beautifully as a taxi member, and I know that sounds a little corny to say for people who may be new to the show, but everything you're saying about your attitude, your process, all that stuff, I believe that the vast majority of people who belong to taxi can be successful at whatever level they want to be, but so much of it is about the attitude. I, I've seen people say stuff like, oh, don't join Taxi until you have a huge catalog of stuff. Don't join Taxi until you're highly accomplished. Or Taxi is, you know, um, ripping people off or scamming them by um, selling them dreams. And we're not selling the dreams. I've said this on the show recently, I believe. Um, people already have the dream. We're we're giving them the tools to achieve their dream and it sounds to me like you've walked in the general store of taxi tools and, and you're going yeah i'm going to try that you know that could work and you're finding that they do that we're not just slinging bs around here that this stuff actually does work and, and it works and we tell people about it because we've been watching people use it successfully it's not like we invented all this methodology we learned about it by watching our successful members and our members are so generous that they've shared it with us, they've shared it with their fellow members. And it's just a, a, a state of mind, a willingness to work harder than other people are willing to work. Um, I wish everybody had your attitude and, and could enjoy the success. You're early, you know, I mean, it's not like you're making a hundred grand a year, but I, I really believe that you will because of everything you're saying. So. Good on you for having the right attitude. Um, well, you know, most, most of my uh, musician friends who, uh, who have been telling me for four, four and a half years that taxi is a scam are not taxi members. And uh, I, I think I know if taxi were a scam. I see what taxi's done for me. And so um, it, every collaboration that I'm in and every library that I'm in and every placement I've gotten on TV has been through taxi. And so the other question that they would ask me, well, how much money have you made? <laughs> well, I hadn't made any money. You know, I was always, yeah. well, I haven't really made any money yet. Well, taxi's a scam. But then this year, my fifth year, uh, I made uh, 600 bucks in in, um, in in royalty money. It's the first time, it was my first two royalty checks. And so, um, so, now when they asked me that question, I said, well, I made 600 bucks. I can't support myself on that money, but it's 600 bucks. That's two, three years of taxi. And obviously it's going to grow because as you know, and I know, and our successful members know, it's cumulative. As long as you keep feeding the pipeline, that number is going to continue. That amount of money is going to continue and it's going to keep growing exponentially because you're going to have more stuff out there in more catalogs. You know, it's, I, I think Matt Hurt, somebody, one of our more senior members, has often said, it's sowing seeds. The more you plant, the more plants you're going to get. And duh, <laughs> it just makes so much sense. I don't know why people read so much into it and try and create obstacles for themselves. You know, well, I, I love the question, how much money have you made? Um, okay, so you've been a member. Let's look at that for a minute. You've been a member for five years. So you paid 300 for your first year. Um, you probably renewed it 200 bucks a year for the next four years. So that's uh, 800 plus 300. So you've invested 1100 bucks and I'm guessing, you know, a couple hundred a year in submissions. So let's say you've got a couple thousand dollars invested. First of all, you couldn't open a, a hot dog cart on the street for that kind of money. And this is opening a business, by the way. 
And so you made 600 bucks this year. Next year, it's probably going to be a thousand or two thousand. The year after that, it's likely to be four or five or six thousand. Generally speaking, and, and this is based on anecdotal stuff that I've heard from members, you kind of go, you know, a few hundred, a couple thousand, a few thousand, and then somewhere around the fourth or fifth year of making money, all of a sudden it goes up to like, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and then by the seventh or eighth year, you might be at 40, 50 grand. And then by the time you get to, you know, eighth, ninth, or tenth year making money, that's where the people who are making the six figure incomes start to see that money coming in because it is a result of cumulatively planting seeds. So you're getting everything right. And, and the next time somebody asks you that question, send them to this video um, or tell them to call me. Um, you talked also about writing uh, specifically for the listing. And you alluded to this earlier in the show when you said in the early stages of your membership, I think you said for the first couple of years, you took your existing jazz album and you kept trying to fit a square peg in a round hole by pitching it for anything you thought was even close. So now um, when you see a listing come up and it's got a specific requirement, um, what kind of thought process do you go through when you decide this is one I'm going to go after? Um, how do you know when to take a pass or when to take the shot? Well, I, I take a pass at, at most things. You know, I, 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 I try to orchestral, uh, the, the epic orchestral, and, I, and I've had a little bit of success with those. Um, but basically, I focus on tension cues, uh, um, solo piano, and also uh, jazz, uh, whether it's a trio quartet. There's a there's a listing that just came up today for tomorrow. I, I think it's a, I just saw it, and I'll definitely be working on that. And that that's for a jazz trio. And um, yeah, when that, I saw that's a pretty, pretty I... deadline. But but I'd like to say that when a when a music library owner contacts you and he says, uh, do you have anything like this? And he sends you a reference track. You probably got one day to get it to him. And if you don't get it to them in one day, you're you're pretty much done. And as a library owner that Joe and I found out the hard way, um, when that library owner says, I need this ASAP, and Joe and I thought, well, we'll get us up in 24 hours. And we, we were pretty proud of ourselves. And she said, when I say ASAP, I mean today. <laughs> right. So, so, so get get used to that kind of thing. And the other thing I wanted to say, say about my, my piano pieces is, um, I've had a really good percentage of forwards with solo piano pieces and a pretty good uh, percentage. You know, once I realized, well, I, I can't put a smooth jazz track in a traditional jazz listing. Once I realized that, I've had really good uh, a forward rate on both those. But in four and a half years, and, and this is not a knock on taxi, this is just something that perplexes me. In four and a half years, not one of those forwards has ever resulted in getting getting one of those uh, piano pieces signed or or placed. And um, so if I hadn't branched out, if I hadn't branched out into tension cues, I'd be doing, uh, I'd be doing a show called How to Get a Lot of Forwards That No Library Wants to Sign. Let's talk about that for a moment because I hear that a lot. Uh, I hear it from people that have been a member for three, four, five years and they say, gee, you know, I'm getting a lot of forwards. I'm not getting a lot of signings as a result. And it's, it's funny that you bring this up because I was on the phone the other day with a, a highly respected small boutique music library owner, um, somebody who I believe has actually placed one of your things on a show. And people in the chat room, please don't go guessing and shooting out names in the chat room because the public gets to see this later. Anyway, uh, that music library owner said to me, Michael, one of the things that I know that frustrates so many of the composers that I work with who are your members is I get stuff or they get stuff forwarded and then it seems to go into an abyss. Um, and she said, I would love to um, bring that up on a panel. And I said, you know what? I think we should do a specific segment of the rally on that because that's something that is almost epidemic among our members. And I think a lot of people don't realize it is a numbers game and there are a million reasons, well, maybe a couple dozen reasons. Um, see, I do tend to exaggerate a little. Uh, <laughs> that When stuff gets forwarded, uh, 
you know, it could be that the library that day when the library owner called us and said, I need tension cues of this type, you know, uh, uh, investigative tension cues. They did need them right there that, you know, and, and they thought that they were going to have an ongoing relationship with a show that used them on a regular basis. So they ran a taxi listing. We get 200 submissions. We sent them 20 or 30 pieces of music that we thought were right on the money and the quality was there. And they get the stuff and they download it and it's sitting in a file on their desktop or somewhere on their computer. And then for whatever reason, maybe it's politics, maybe it's financial, business related, who knows, the relationship they had with that show falls apart. Now they've got that file of stuff sitting on their uh, hard drive. They're not going to go to the trouble of reaching out to those 20 or 30 people. First of all, they're not going to sign all 20 or 30. They're going to sign three, four, five, six, whatever, some smaller number. Um, they're not going to reach out and say, hey, I got your stuff from Taxi. I'd like to sign it because that kind of immediate need that they had just went away. Not to say that some similar need won't come back in a week or a month or a year, or maybe even seven years, which I believe is the longest we've ever had a piece of music sit on somebody's desktop until they were offered a deal on it. Um, but there are all those reasons that cause music that's forwarded to not trigger a response, whether it's from a music library or it's from a music supervisor. So I, I think when you guys see this show up on the rally schedule that if you've ever had that feeling, please be in the grand ballroom for this because we're going to dig really deep and show you guys what all the answers are. And the end result will be that you'll feel so much better and not discouraged when you get music forwarded um, that takes a long time or maybe ever get a response on that it, it won't way heavy on you and it won't um so it won't discourage you from from you know uh moving forward and just plowing ahead and keep cranking them out because it at the end of the day it is a numbers game um let's see you also talked about the importance of reading a listing which bria we did an episode i don't know a few months ago you might want to go yeah interpreting a listing can you get that and post a link in the chat room for that um, also, we should post it in the comment section under this video today. But the importance of reading a listing, I believe, is key. And people, um, this is one that's sitting on my desk um, just by coincidence. I didn't pull this out for the show. Um, this was one that ran weeks ago and actually had a deadline of June 5th. And it was for current sounding and envelope pushing country songs with male vocals are needed by a nashville based independent record label that's looking for material for their roster of incredible artists so the person who owns this company and runs this company is a bit of a rebel in nashville um he's also an old friend of mine it's not like we're besties and he crashes at my place when he's in la but we might have gone out drinking a couple of times in Nashville and we know each other. And recently a mutual friend of ours was with him in Nashville who mentioned my name. He goes, Lasco, hang on a minute. Uh, and he ran this listing. So this is a guy who has become a powerful figure in Nashville. He goes against the grain. He signs stuff that nobody else would take a chance on because it's not necessarily obviously commercial. The guy has a great track record that other people in the more the more typical part of country music, um, follow his lead. So the important part of this listing was current sounding and envelope pushing country songs. So he asked that after the screeners did their thing, if I would get my ears on the stuff before it went to him. And this morning when I got to work, the first thing I did was sit down with Tom from my, our A&R staff and we listened to, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, 15 forwards. Uh, and, and regretfully, I had to pull almost all of them back from being forwarded to this guy because most people, even though the forwards were all pretty darn good, I, I would say like B plus at their lowest, um, up to some that were a high A minus. You're thinking, why wouldn't you forward a high A minus? And it's not like we sit here and write those grades and I, I just have to give you some sort of reference so that this you can have this in context. Um, 
it was heartbreaking to me. It was gut-wrenching. And maybe four or five times a year, one of my industry friends will ask me to do this. And as a matter of fact, next week, we're actually doing a show about that specific listing. And we're going to play you the music that the screeners picked to be forwarded. And I personally had to pull back out. We only ended up sending one thing. And it's not to say that there wasn't some really strong music in there, but most people, almost all people, missed envelope pushing country songs. The stuff that we heard wasn't pushing the envelope. It wasn't different enough. It wasn't, um, yeah, it didn't push an envelope. Uh, it was just sounded like just another country song about, you know, putting the top down on the car, going to the swimming hole with your girlfriend. It was all really strong, but it had been done before, and I know this guy well enough, and I know his track record of the types of acts and songs he signs. He would have thought, Lasco, why, why would you send me that stuff? And he never would have run another listing. So um, you address that uh, in talking about reading, the importance of reading the listing. How do you approach reading the listing? How do you make sure that you take all those things that we put in, because there are usually several things that go into the stew of a listing. Do you prioritize them? Do you go, okay, well, this is the main point. This is like a, a sub point. How do you look at it? Yeah, I don't, I don't look at anything in a taxi listing as a sub point. And, uh, and I don't recommend reading the listing um, on the taxi site. I recommend copying and pasting them into a Word document because there are so many descriptions in a, in a taxi listing and most people when they read they scan uh -huh. and it's real easy uh, you know I have missed and it's been more, it's been more than once unfortunately I have missed uh, start with a melodic motif or a simple melodic motif I have missed that and that that's a pretty long string of words to miss and then I would get a return where's the melodic motif this listing is, is asking for and so what I do now is I bold every descriptive word and I and I I make it larger than, than the rest of the print and that includes uh, things like mid tempo up tempo uh, I, Paul and I submitted a, a track uh, that, that you have you've actually played on taxi TV it's called uh, dizzy and ditzy and I took one of the reference tracks and um, I basically figured out the BPM and I said well I'm gonna go at that BPM and the uh, this was going right to, to the music, directly to the music supervisor, and he said something like, "Oh man, Henry, this 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 was perfect." But I realized that one of the reference tracks is a bit on the slow side, but unfortunately, this doesn't meet the mid-tempo criteria. So after that, I started bolding uh, mid-tempo, and and the other thing too is the the cue length. If if you get uh, let's say you get three three listings and they and they all say must be at least 90 seconds and you, you don't have any cues that are 90 seconds you just you know you should but you don't right and so so it says, it says um, must be at least 90 seconds I'll submit these tracks that are two minutes long and you submit them and that's fine and then that one listing comes along and it says must be around 90 seconds and all you see is 90 seconds <laughs> and then you submit three tracks that, that, are, that are two minutes long, and you get three returns. So, uh, and then, then the due date and the time. The time is usually midnight, but, uh, and, you know, I, I might be having a 60s flashback, but I think there was one time where a taxi uh, listing uh, deadline at noon. Right, a couple and, of weeks, uh, uh, like a month or so ago, I remember. Yeah, and uh, so... Bold, bold everything. Um, scanning a taxi listing, you're just looking uh, for a return. And, and and I have to add on to something that you were talking, we were talking about about how um, how uh, when when music supervisors or library owners need something, they need it now. I've got a friend of mine who's a, who's a taxi member, and we both got forwards, and there were tension cues. We both got forwards to a. Um, uh, a library and the library owner contacted I imagine everybody and said how many more of these do you have and how soon can you get me 10 well I already had 10 so I sent him 10 and he signed all of them 
the friend of mine didn't have 10, and he, and he said, give me a couple of days. <laughs> and so he, he worked his butt off in that couple of days, submitted them, and the library owner never even responded to him. So, wow. so that's, that's really the music business. I mean, if, if you miss your opportunity, it's gone. You know, and the other thing I wanted to say too, because um, somebody misinterpreted what I said last time, and you might have gotten a phone call from this person, but but I said you have 15 seconds to impress a music star. That's it, because they listen to so much music during the course of the day. They don't have any more time than that, so they listen to 15 seconds, and they make the determination on whether they're going to use your track or even listen longer based on that first 15 seconds. And now what's the uh, the episode over again, I noticed that someone asked the question, did he just say that screeners only listen to 15 seconds? Wow. On the track? And, uh, and, and I can say that, that is absolutely not the case because I got a forward from a screener and he said, I enjoyed the track, but you might want to bring all that good stuff at 30 seconds up to 15 seconds because the next person who listens to this track might not have 30 seconds. I got to say, when I was in that meeting this morning with Tom and we were reviewing the stuff the screeners had picked to forward to that uh, label president in Nashville, there were a couple instances where we knew, and I'm not exaggerating this, and nobody watching the show today would argue the point with me if they were in the room with us at the time. There were a couple of instances where we knew within three notes that we weren't going to be able to forward what we were listening to. And you're thinking, how could you possibly know in three notes? And frankly, it could have been any three notes. And the reason was because the instrument that, that started um, in both cases was so obviously like wind beneath my wings era keyboard, you know, like a, um, a really phasey sounding um, Fender Rhodes from like the mid eighties that instantly your brain says this is really dated well if it sounds that dated that quick and both tom and i kind of whipped our heads around looked at each other and went whoa um i know this label president is he's not gonna listen any further than that because it's not envelope pushing that's what this guy's looking for so i know that sounds harsh and i know people are going to take that out of context but they should understand that something as simple as the subtle message you're sending by the bad choice, poor choice of an instrument sound um, can, can work against you. I, I will say that we, were quickly, we quickly confirmed that the rest of it wasn't really right either. We did listen further, but you know when you know, and sometimes it's just that one instrument. Or it could be... Uh, a chord progression in the intro that sounds like uh, a song that's been done before. We heard one today, one song where if there were nine notes in the melodic line, seven of them sounded like a previous hit from the 80s. Um, it, anybody in the room would have heard that. And frankly, I was surprised the screener forwarded it. The song was really good and the overall everything was really good. But if you listen to everything but the last two notes of the melody line, you would think they just stole it from that previous hit. So couldn't forward it. Um, let's play some of your music because uh, we've only got about uh, 12 minutes left in the show and we haven't listened to anything yet. Uh, what would you like Bria to, to play? Well, uh, she, she can play either one. The, these were the first, uh, in case someone came in late, these were the, the very first tracks that I submitted um, to Taxi. In 2013, uh, it was for for a traditional uh, jazz listing, and I'm not going to say. Uh, I'll just let the listeners decide uh, whether it was a forward or whether it was a, a return. All right, uh, you good to go, Bria? Yeah. Okay. Just either one. Uh, yeah. Little volume on your end.
only got eight minutes left. I wasn't sure if that was a six-minute jazz tune or a three-minute jazz tune. Anyway, amazing, Henry. You are the real deal, buddy, and uh, that was amazing. So what was the listing for, and did it get forwarded or not? It was for traditional jazz, and it was a return. It was my, my very first return. And uh, what I, uh, I went and looked, and what the screener said was, with the long piano intro, it takes a while for the track to get going. And it also seems closer to smooth jazz. No, yes, right. No, no, that, that, that was my other track. Uh, he, he just didn't look like the long intro. So, um, Which, yeah, you know, was what a, was it a film yeah. and TV listing? Was it a, was it a what? Uh, was it requesting music for film and TV or was it a record listing? I do remember it was a traditional jazz, and I, I, I tried to force feed a number. You know, finally, I, I understood because this is a different player, and, and know that uh, to answer a question, that that, that was not Paul uh, Cruteau. Um, you know, I I had the, he was he was a really good saxophone player, but he played a lot of riffs, not in that particular track, but but in other tracks that are just not usable on TV because they, they would interfere with dialogue. So uh, there were a lot of reasons why uh, my album didn't fly uh, for Taxi, and I, I think we talked about, about a number of them today. Uh, you know, I went in thinking my album, my album is the greatest, and it's going to get forwarded no matter what, and this, this is going to be the way I can promote my album, and none of that really happened. It, so, it, it's... I've, seen, I've, seen, I've seen other people on your show uh, I remember one person, I forget his name, but he came in the taxi as a singer-songwriter and wasn't getting any traction. And uh, uh, then he started doing instrumentals. And boom, you know, that started working for him. Happens all the time. Uh, I believe uh, Stephen Baird, um, who's definitely a, a six-figure, maybe even multi-six-figure earning uh, instrumentalist now, I think first time I met him at a road rally, uh, when he was a pretty new taxi member, he wanted to be a rock star, a country star. I can't remember which, but uh, he quickly realized that instrumentals were the way to go. I don't know if you guys are seeing the flickering lights, but I've got a, a bulb above me that uh, looks like it's on the edge of death right now, and I don't want to dim the lights for the rest of the show, but if you see a flickering, it's not YouTube, it's a light bulb. Um, let's play one more. What else do you have, Bria? This is called Free Spirit. Bye. 
Henry, you are a very, very, very talented man. This, uh, somebody said, you know, this is like listening jazz or something to that effect. Yeah, absolutely. This is when you go out and spend a lot of money on speakers and an incredible stereo system and you come home and sit in that, uh, I forget what they call the chairs, like weightless chairs or whatever they call them. You sit down and listen to this with a glass of wine in your hand. That is really, really, really good jazz. Congratulations on that. Um, hey, thank. Yeah, I noticed uh, some of the comments. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. Um, uh, uh, it's a couple of people mentioned the uh, the Yellow Jackets, and uh, that was one of my favorite groups. And the uh, saxophone player who played on that, he had the idea. Why don't we contact uh, Jimmy Haslip and see if he'll play on on three of our tracks? And Jimmy Haslip was one of the founders of the Yellow Jackets and one of the best bass players uh, probably in the world. And I thought, well, that's a really cool idea. Well, that's when we play on three of our tracks. And he got back to us the next day, and he said, well, I charge $1,000 for a day, but if you don't mind, I'd like to play on these, these two other tracks as well. I won't charge you anymore, and, um, because I really dig these, these two other tracks. And he, he drove up here from L.A. It's about a three-and-a-half-hour drive, and uh, he was the most gracious uh, person that, I, that I've ever uh, one of the most gracious people I've ever run across, and I kick myself because while we, while I was uh, uh, going from from song to song, he was doing this doodling, and afterwards I thought, man, if, if I could have gotten that, that I could have used that in other tracks. And then I asked him to do an intro for for this particular piece that you just heard, Free Spirit, and he just off the cuff uh, played an intro. Uh, he didn't use charts; he played everything from memory, and I asked him to do a solo on another track, and he did a great solo. And by the way, this was also a return. So it was my second return. And um, the screener said, nice sounding track with good performances. This track is a little little closer to contemporary fusion than the traditional style of the listing. And that's absolutely correct. Wow. So it, it does prove your point that you made much earlier in the show, which is a great piece of music does not get forwarded just because it's a great piece of music. It's got to be the right piece of music and be great. It requires both of those things. Right. Um, who engineered that stuff, by the way? That was, um, that, that was kind of funny. And unfortunately, the, the saxophone player and I, who had gotten along really well for two years, that's how long it took to make that album, um, we decided, well, we're, we're going to mix it ourselves. Well, we didn't know anything about mixing. This was back in uh, 2007, by the way. And uh, so we, he, he brought up a bunch of uh, uh, saxophone albums, and um, he, uh, we did the mix. And I said, I'm going to send this to, to Jimmy, Jimmy Haslip, and see what he thinks. And uh, he was really nice about it, but he said in a very nice way, you know, you really, uh, these tracks are too good, and you got too many good players on him for for you uh you need to have this mixed by somebody who, who knows what he's doing and i and i'll, I'll find the guy's name and i'll, and I'll you know I'll, I'll email you because i don't remember it offhand so so the saxophone player kind of went nuts on me and uh he you know he said some some, some stuff about jimmy and what, what does he know and, and uh you know i think it sounds fine i played it for my friends it, it sounds fine so i called jimmy and i said you know this is causing a rift between Phone player and me, and uh, and then Jimmy, you know, being being as gracious as he is, he said, "Well, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about." Well, of course he knows what he's talking about, <laughs> but that's what he said. And, and he said, "Let me give it to one of the best recording engineers in LA, and um, and then we'll see what he has to say." Well, what he had to say was, um, "It sounds like it was mixed by a couple of amateurs," <laughs> and I said, oh, "Well, it was," and that's why it sounds that way. I, I said, can you be more specific? And uh, he said, yeah, it's, it's orally odd and spatially strange. There you and go. I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, it sounds like the saxophone player is right in your face and all the rest of the band is behind a closed door. Yes. And, and, and there, there's that old saying, you can tell who makes an album by which instrument is the loudest. <laughs> so, so, it's so, so true. I, I called Jimmy. And Jimmy says, let me set you up with a guy. He owes me a favor, and he'll mix and master it for $1,500. Wow. And I said, I said, uh, okay, that, that'd be great. The only problem is we were scheduled to play at the Bakersfield Jazz Festival, and the saxophone player wanted us to have CDs there to sell. And this means we wouldn't have CDs. So he, he 
was further upset. He accused me of hijacking the album, and I thought, how can I hijack my own album? And uh, <laughs> so, so I went down, and a, a professional guy, uh, I don't remember his name offhand, but anyway, uh, at the studio with him, and I watched him, and, and you know, um, I was amazed at how crystal clear, you could hear the hi-hats, you could hear everything. Everything is, uh, it, and then when it came time to pay him the 1500 bucks, he said, just pay me $750. And I said, why? He said, because the album is too good uh, from Pseudo Master on it. And I have a buddy of mine who works at Lurson Mastering, and he said he'd do it for $750. Wow. So, so Jimmy, and so he took 750 bucks out of his own pocket so that, so that the album could sound better. And it sounded fine. I played it for somebody who, who does mixing, and he says, I, I, did you say this hasn't been mastered yet? Because it sure sounds like it has. Well, it, it's great sounding. Coming from uh, an engineer myself uh, who feels very privileged in that I got to record orchestral stuff and jazz stuff. Uh, you know, I was mainly a rock guy and did a lot of country rock back in the day, which was like mid-70s through the mid-80s. But um, do you remember a jazz guitarist named Ernest Wranglin from Jamaica? No. All right, well, he was apparently a big deal in Jamaica and well-known amongst jazz guitar players. And I got a call from whatever label he was on, and they wanted me. Why they wanted me, I don't know, because it's not like I had a big jazz um, catalog that I'd engineered. But they hired me to do this record, and about an hour into the session, Ernest Wrangling came in the control room, and he kicked everybody out in a very polite and gentleman-like way, and he said to me, I don't think you really understand how to record a jazz record. And I said, well, you know, I've got a half a dozen gold and platinum records hanging on my wall. He said, doesn't mean you know how to record jazz. He said, come back out in the room and we're going to play one time. We're going to run down the song without headphones. And I want you to just walk around the room and listen to what you hear. And that's what I want on the record. And that was such an eye-opening event for me. And I did the record, made him very happy. But uh, wow, it's... You know, jazz is all about the interplay, more so than some other forms of music, I would venture to say. And, and if you can make the listener feel like they're part of that language of jazz between the players, that's what jazz records should sound like. That's what yours sounds like. So great job on everybody's part working on that record. Um, hey, sorry, say again? Hey, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, man, I, I'm... Proud to know you and really impressed with that stuff. Um, let's do a drawing. Bria, get your fingers ready. Um, so this is for the Shure MV5 microphone. And there it is in real life. There's the box which I've ungracefully taken apart. Uh, and somebody is going to win this puppy, and I would love, uh, as Ann House did today, and if you could send us a little email uh, at some point after you've used your MV51 and let us know what you used it on, how you used it, um, something that uh, I can pass along to the folks at Shure. Um, and, and by the way, they didn't give me this stuff and tell me I had to give it away. They, I think they sent it to me as like, hey, Michael, check this stuff out. You'll like it. But... Uh, I can only use so much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, yeah, whoever wins this, do the same. Use it, let us know what you think. I think this one was actually created for doing like remote recordings. When you're on the road, um, it's not entirely remote. It's meant to be more portable. The other one is built like a, a tank. That other microphone was so solid, so heavy. So anyway, here's how you win. Uh, you type in a plus one and Bria is going to run her finger up and down the chat room list with her eyes shut and go bingo and wherever her finger lands that person will win there you go um and go plus ones I love the comments. It looks like Hal's eyeball. Larry McGee. Larry McGee? Mm -hmm. I think it might be pronounced Maggie. Yeah, congratulations, Larry. 
You have won yourself the Shure M5, MV5, sorry, uh, microphone. We will <laughs> rebox it and send it out to you in a couple days. And send your address to TaxiTV at Taxi.com. Send your address to TaxiTV at Taxi.com, and Bria will get this thing out to you in the next couple of days. Um, Henry, thank you again. Uh, your insights, uh, you are so well-spoken and so honest with yourself um, that it's infectious. Um, I hope that everybody gets a chance to watch this episode so that they can learn about um, just another way to be successful using taxis. So much of it is attitude and pragmatism and, and practicality. You're all that stuff. So congratulations, not to mention a great jazz artist. and. Uh, I will see you sometime between November 1st and November 4th at the Road Rally, meaning Henry, and I hope the rest of you as well. If you haven't checked it out, go to taxi.com slash rally, uh, and you'll see last year's schedule. We're working on this year's schedule, which I promise will be at least as good and probably even 15% better than last year's Road Rally. We've done 21 of them, and we've never had one that sucked. <laughs> They've all been really, really good. People love them. Um, people fly from all over the world. I mean, places like Australia, Hong Kong, South America. Um, I think Santa Claus came down from the North Pole one year. He said, oh, forget those kids. Why do I need to be working in my workshop with all those little elves when I could be going to the road rally? And he loved it. So I hope you guys come. Um, we will see you back here next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV. Until then, I bid you adieu. I'm looking for the band. There's the band. And over and out. Bye-bye, you guys. See you next week.